Art thou the king of the Jews? Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my people fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. Art thou a king then? Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. What is truth? Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. I have examined him before you and find no fault with this man touching those things whereof you accuse him. I have sent him to Herod. He has found that nothing worthy of death has been done. I will therefore chastise him and release him. According to your custom, at this time of year, one prisoner shall be released. Barabbas. Free Barabbas. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Crucify you. I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it.
Matthew 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom my price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted, and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? And they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. Verse 24. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him, and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Verse 32. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, 
they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers, who were crucified with him, also reviled him in the same way. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema shabbanathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Verse 57. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Verse 62. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. It doesn't matter how many times that I read Matthew 27, it still gets me. Seeing and imagining the crucifixion, the suffering of our Lord and Savior for my sins. We did notice in the last lesson on Matthew 26, Judas betraying Jesus. And I said yesterday, I don't think that Judas realized that his betrayal would lead to Jesus' death because of what happens right here. When he realizes that he has been condemned, he tries to fix it, try to make it all better, right? give back the 30 pieces of silver. 
And the chief priests and elders say, That's, you deal with that. He is so grieved by this that he goes out and hangs himself. He betrayed Jesus, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But one sinful action doesn't replace another sinful action. While Judas did betray Jesus with a kiss, Peter also betrayed Jesus when he denied him three times. And we'll see the difference between Peter and Judas later. We have Jesus before Pilate in verse 11. Uh, Pilate really just does not want to have to deal with this. Uh, his hand is sort of being forced here. And so he finds no reason for him to die. Uh, but uh, because of the riot that would possibly take place, he does consent. Um, and then we have this interesting deal here with Barabbas, who is a, he's a thug and a murderer. And they choose him in order to be released instead of Jesus. And so when he asks, when Pilate asks, what shall I do with Jesus? They said, let him be crucified. He decides to wash his hands of the whole matter. And he, re he releases Barabbas and delivers Jesus to be crucified. I will say there's an interesting thing here that takes place between Pilate and his wife. As he's sitting on the judgment seat. He's given opportunity to do the right thing. His wife sends him word, Hey, don't have anything to do with this righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him today in a dream. And yet here we are, Pilate, you know, more worried about a riot than anything else, decides, you know, I'm done with this. I, I wash my hands. Go ahead. You have him. Verse 26 says that they released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Those words don't really detail for us the excruciating, painful experience of scourging. Being whipped by those leather cords that had attached to the ends of them bones or glass or rocks. Jesus would have been a bloody pulp by the time they were done scourging him. Now, typically the Romans scourged people before they put them on the cross. It weakened their bodies and made it easier for the Roman soldiers to do their job of putting somebody on the cross. Hard to do that when someone's wiggling around. So scourging them takes all the fight out of them. Many times, prisoners die during the scourging. These are Roman soldiers. They have no limit. They can scourge as many times as they want. Now, I will say that Jesus would have gone to the cross even without the scourging. He went to Jerusalem willingly knowing full well what awaited him there. He went to Gethsemane willingly, knowing full well that there he would be betrayed. He went to Gethsemane willingly, knowing full well that those closest to him would all fall away and desert and deny him. He went with the arresters willingly, knowing full well that he would not be released unharmed. He went back and forth between the high priest, the Sanhedrin, Pilate and Herod willingly, knowing full well that none of them would exonerate him, and knowing that the trials that he endured were all illegal under the law. He went with the soldiers willingly, knowing full well that they were commissioned to beat him near to death. He went to Golgotha, the place of the skull, willingly, knowing full well that it was a place not just of crucifixion, but the place of his crucifixion. He went to the cross willingly, knowing full well that although he had the power to save yourself, come down from the cross, as the passerbys urged him, mocking him, as we see here in verses 39 and 40, he wouldn't. Verse 34 tells us that he went to and through the agonies of the cross willingly, without the pain-numbing mixture of wine mixed with myrrh, offered, knowing full well the cost of refusal. He went to and stayed on that cross, willingly, knowing full well what it means for the souls of all mankind, even those who crucified him. The physical suffering of the Savior, though very much a part of the story, isn't really the main point here, is it? Instead, it's the wondrous spiritual beauty of him who willingly and resolutely went to Golgotha with the full knowledge 
of what it would cost him personally and what it would buy us eternally. The physical cost was indeed hendously tremendous, but the love for the souls of all mankind made it worth the price that Jesus paid, that God paid by sending his only begotten son to the cross. We will talk about the crucifixion of Jesus as we go back and forth to the gospel accounts throughout this whole year, as we see the apostles writing about the crucifixion of Jesus, as we see them preach about the crucifixion of Jesus. I do want to show you this chart here. I think it's an interesting one. It shows all the events that took place at the crucifixion. It takes all the gospel accounts, shows us what took place from the moment that Jesus arrived at Golgotha until the time that his body was wrapped in a linen cloth and lay in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I'll put the link to this chart on this YouTube video in the description section. I encourage you to click the link, print it, put it in your Bible, keep it with you, look at it and think about the cross of Jesus often. Before we close Matthew 27, I do want to say something about the events that took place when he died. We have the darkness over the land. We're told that the verse 51, that the curtain of the temple was torn in two, the earth shook, rocks were split, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. All of these things that took place here, verse 54, was enough to convince the Roman satyrian, this Gentile, that Jesus was God's son, the only person there at the cross to see who Jesus was for who Jesus was, was a Gentile. We've already seen that several times in the book of Matthew, haven't we? Gentiles seem to demonstrate more faith than the Jews time and time again. Let me go back to verse 52 for a moment. The tombs were open, bodies of the saints fallen asleep or raised. What's going on with that? What does that mean? Did they stay raised? Were they alive? Were these Old Testament saints? Uh, what's going on here? Where do these people go? We don't see them returning to their graves? Well, the answer is, I don't know. Right? The, the passage only states that many saints were physically raised. Now, beyond knowing that it was only righteous people and not any wicked people that were raised, other than that, we have no idea. I don't know how many people were raised or how long they had been dead, nor do we know what happened to them afterwards. One commentator pointed out that it would have probably been more impressive to see my departed grandmother walking down the street than to see the Old Testament hero, Ruth. I wouldn't recognize Ruth, but I would remember my grandmother. And whether that is what happened, again, we don't know. God did not choose to reveal to us those answers. To make assumptions is useless because, like I just said, we don't know, so it would be only be a guess. And we can't base our faith on guesses. Right? We have to base our faith on truth. So the answer is, don't know. But wow, would that be something to see? How impressive that would be. How frightening that would be. How many there that day, like the centurion, saw all the things that happened when Jesus died on that cross, said, Truly, this was the Son of God. I am thankful to God this morning for Jesus, the crucified King. I am thankful that he was willing to suffer what he did so that we might be saved. When faced with all that Jesus did for you and I on that cross, can we honestly say that we are living for him like we should? You need to think about that. You need to contemplate that. And if I'm not living for him, I need to repent of that and always remember what he did for us. While it is true, the Jews that day said his blood be on us and our children. And while the Roman soldiers were the ones that beat him and nailed him to that cross, you and I were there too. You and I, because of our sins, also crucified the Son of God. There's a song that we sing, Were You There? When they crucified my Savior? The answer is, we were, because of our sins. 
Now, thanks be to God as well that Matthew does not end at chapter 27. That Matthew has chapter 28 and the resurrection of Jesus. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Zion.